Let's talk about marine invertebrate phylums. First off, what's an invertebrate? An invertebrate is an animal without a backbone or spinal cord. So everyone reach back and touch your backbone. You can feel it right there in the middle of your back. It's a structure that holds your skeleton together. So it keeps us in our skeletal support so we can stand upright and play sports and jump up and down, right? And vertebrates don't have that spinal cord, that backbone, that internal structure. They have other things, but they don't have a true spinal cord. Now, what is a phylum? A phylum is a grouping of animals with like characteristics. Scientists use phylum to um, basically use this taxonomic range uh, from domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species to make sure that we know exactly what an animal is. There's a lot of different types of animals out there in the world, and we can use these different classifications uh, to be able to make sure that we're putting them in the right area. So this fox is phylum chordata. That means things without, with a backbone, sorry. That means things with a backbone. So our marine mammals, class mammalia, order carnivora, there's a lot of different, different um, layers that you can go to get it down to the specific species, the scientific name of that animal. If I Googled purple clam, I have 32,500,000 results of a purple clam. Scientists need to get down to the genus and species so I can try and track down exactly what type of clam I'm trying to understand. So we can separate them in different categories. And phylum, when we break it down to phylum, it means the grouping of those light characteristics that are kind of getting a little bit more specific. So whenever we're using phylum, we're talking about those animals that, um, we can break it down into those light characteristics that truly define what that animal is. So let's first talk about phylum periphera. So phylum periphera is basically our sea sponges. And sponges in the ocean aren't square and they don't wear pants. But they are asymmetrical. Asymmetrical means that if I cut it in half, I'm not going to be able to get an even amount of that animal on each side. They're asymmetrical. Even the tubular ones are growing in different directions. You can't just slice it down the middle and have a perfect carbon copy of the other side on each side uh, of each animal. They're also organized in different types of specialized uh, specialized cells called collar cell cells. So they're not um, really complicated animals, but they have these collar cells that have a flagella, which basically means they have a tail, and they constantly pulse back and forth and bring water into, into the animal itself and create this current. So the sponge can eat plankton and things like that. And they don't have really true tissues, and they don't really have... Um, like a, a true structure like made out of calcium carbonate like our oysters or or clams or things like that they have little spicules spicules which means they're very porous so that's why kind of we have this idea of a sponge a very porous they're constantly bringing in water they're eating that plankton and they're also sessile organisms which means they stay planted in one spot for their entire life so they'll always be attached to something else so you can always see these little tubular animals kind of on the reefs and other oyster shells and they're a great color uh, pop for a lot of the coral reefs that we have next is phylum annelida so these are our worms. Uh, believe it or not, this worm on the um, right of the screen is called a Christmas tree worm. There are a lot of different really cool marine worms out there, and this also includes our earthworms and things that we can see on land, our inchworm, our earthworms, things like that. One of the characteristics that bind these groups together and why it's in phylum Annelida is because they have a segmented body. 
So they have all these different legs, all these different segments, all going through their body. You can kind of track it down. And they also have bilateral symmetry. If I cut a, a worm, um, hot dog style, if, if that's still used as a term in school, or straight down the middle, in half, I will have the exact copy on each side. So they have bilateral symmetry. They also have this thing called a column. Think of it kind of like as a squishy waterbed. So they don't have a true backbone. They don't really have a very organized skeletal structure. They're a worm. Uh, they can bend all over, tie themselves in a knot, right? But when they're bracing themselves, if they fall or if they're getting some sort of impact, they have this kind of um, water layer inside their body that allows it to absorb some of that impact. So they do have a kind of an internal water structure that allows them to um, have some sort of skeletal protection. They also have a cuticle on the body wall. Um, it's very porous. Um, and it's very slimy. A lot of animals can, or a lot of the worms can secrete um, fluids outside of that cuticle on the body wall. And some of them can even breathe through that cuticle on the body wall. Next is phylum arthropoda, and these are a lot of animals. A lot of them are in the ocean, um, but most of them are actually on land. These are going to be like your butterflies or your um, or your spiders or things like that. These are animals with jointed appendages, arthropoda. Um, they are segmented, um, which means they are kind of in different, um, you can kind of segment and break them up into different parts, head, torso, tail, and um, things like that. And it, Internally as well, you can kind of segment them. They have an exoskeleton, uh, usually made out of this stuff called chitin. They do have bilateral symmetry, and they also have an open circulatory system, which means their blood isn't contained in veins or arteries. It's kind of swishing around in their body all in, in one. It's not really contained in anything other than their body cavity. Now let's go back to jointed appendages. Phylum arthropoda uh, means that they have joints. So if you could do the robot for me right now, you can move your arms back and forth. You can move your fingers. We have jointed appendages as well. Crabs, you can make your crab claws. They're, um, they can wave their arms around, and you can see at each joint that they are moving that, um, that appendage. So they are all jointed. That first picture uh, on the top there, those are barnacles. Barnacles are also in phylum arthropoda because they meet all the requirements. But the barnacles kind of look like a crab doing handstand where they're opening and closing that extra exoskeleton that they're creating um, and almost looks like um, a clam opening and closing a little bit. And they're able to take these frilly little legs out and move them around and catch plankton. So the crabs and lobsters and, and shrimp, and they're, they're really great about being able to move all those appendages. And they can also shed that exo exoskeleton, those crabs, lobsters, and shrimps. As they grow, they'll grow that exoskeleton, they'll harden it up. And whenever they're ready to get rid of it, they'll kind of slip out the back of it um, and have another skeleton created on the inside. So it allows them to grow. It allows them to have space and they're a little soft when they do this but then it'll harden up again and it takes 11 months this means they can also kind of grow back those appendages if they lost them so each molting they can grow more and more of a body part phylum echinodermata means spiny skin echino means spiny dermata means skin so the requirements to be in this phylum is to have spiny skin and have tube feet. 
So tube feet are like at the bottom of starfish. They have these, almost they look like Shrek ears. And there's hundreds of these little Shrek eared little things on the bottom of starfish and sea cucumbers and sand dollars. And they're able to move around. It's, I call it a water vascular system as well. They're moving water back and forth throughout their body. And they're able to move as well. So for if phylum Echinodermata, these are all going to be um, aquatic or marine species. They are all going to live in some sort of water source. There's none that will live on land. And they can regenerate themselves. So if you look at this sand dollar right here, um, this is uh, basically the, ner the nervous system um, of the sand dollar. Um, that central disc um, of, of, you can see it in this serpent star, starfish right here, in this bat star right here, um, in the sea cucumber it's a little bit harder, um, and at the bottom of sea urchins you can see it, it's called an Aristotle's lantern, um, for the, um, sea, uh, urchins, but for... The central nervous system is located right in the center. So if you get a piece of that central nervous system whenever you're breaking apart, so if um, a starfish will lose its leg or a brittle sea star can lose its leg, um, they can regenerate that leg. But if you get a little bit of that central disc in there, if you cut off a little bit of that central disc, they can regenerate a whole new organism. Uh, it will be a carbon copy of the first one, but they can regenerate a whole new organism. So they do have um, a brain, they do have nervo uh, a nervous system, um, it's just in the center of their body. And they also have radial symmetry. So kind of think it of like a pie. You can split a pie in different ways and it'll all have the same slice of that pie. Um, radial symmetries, you can have a circular radial symmetry, and with starfish you can have pintle radial symmetry where you can cut it five different times. You have the same slice of the pie each time. So for those guys, um, it's really awesome. They also can have regeneration of their internal body parts. With sea cucumbers, sea cucumbers will do this thing called evisceration, and what they'll do is their stomach parts um, will actually come out of their body. They can regurgitate their internal organs. So if a predator is coming towards them, they can regurgitate their internal organs. The, the fish or the, the shark or whatever is trying to eat it can eat that pile of regurgitated organs and the sea cucumber can try to, um, to go as fast as they can with their little two feet off to safety so they can survive. So it's called evisceration, and they can use that to kind of deter predators from eating them and get to safety, and then they can regenerate their internal organs. They can regenerate their stomach. Starfish, like this bat star right here, and oh, most of the sea stars out there will actually um, open up and their stomach will come outside of their body. They'll um, they'll be like on top of like a dead fish or or a um, a clam or something like that. And their stomach will start to digest the food outside of the body and then bring it all back in. So they have a really cool way of eating and feeding. The um, sea urchin will have this what's called an Aristotle's lantern. It's basically five different kind of hard parts that almost act as teeth. So as they're going through on the rocks and um, uh, in, in the crevices of the rocks, they'll find all this algae and they'll slowly scrape that algae off the rocks with, with those five parts that they're using to eat. With um, uh, sand dollars, they are algae eaters as well. So they have their tube feet and whenever they're dead, they have that, you can see that beautiful star in the center. When they're alive, you don't see that. They kind of look a little fuzzy and brown. They have all these tube and kind of hairy almost. They're, they're really a weird texture. And on the bottom, they have all these tube feet and they'll kind of act like a Roomba. And they'll 
they'll slowly, as a circular object, will go down, um, will go on the bottom of the seafloor and constantly kind of roam with their two feet, and they'll be able to to scrape off all that algae um, on the bottom of the seafloor. So it's really cool to be able to see them, and a lot of people do find sand dollars on the beach. And if it ever has that weird kind of brownish texture on the top of it, it is alive. And if it has a, a distinct star on it, it is dead. Phylum Cnidaria are the ones with stinging cells. So these animals are able to sting you. So if you've ever been in the ocean and you found felt a stinging on you, it's probably from a, a member of Phylum Cnidaria. A nidocyte cell is basically a cell that um, jellyfish will have and, and sea anemones will have. And what they'll do is it's kind of coiled up and wrapped up. And any time it brushes up against something, it will actually um, kind of inject this needle that goes into it that has a little hook. Um, the needle or the thread will go and hook onto something. They have this little barb um, that they'll use. They'll hook onto something and potentially be able to bring it to their um, their top of their body where their stomach is and digest that food. With us, they can't really do that, so it will um, basically put the barb in us, inject us with a little bit of their venom, and venom is injected, poison is ingested, so if that's a great way to remember that. Um, jellyfish are venomous, so they'll inject some of that venom, and then they'll um, retract that nidocyte back into their um, that little pore. So they have um, they have the ability to grab their food and be able to to eat them um, that way and bring it up to their stomach and that's what they're doing with small fish and things like that. So if you ever get stung by a jellyfish, you always want to put more salt water on it or some vinegar or meat, meat tenderizer um, or or pee on it. Uh, different things like that will help your sting if you ever get stung by a jellyfish. They also have radial symmetry, so just like um, a kind of dermata, you can cut them all around like a pie, and you'll get even slices no matter how many cuts that you get. You'll get an exact um, copy of that jellyfish. They have a very minimal skeleton. The jellyfish are mostly water, um, but they have a very, even sea anemones will have a very minimal skeleton. They lack cephalization, which is basically um, a brain. Um, they, they lack like a brain structure. They have sensory organelles in the head, but they don't have a very organized thinking space in their brain. And they also have one opening. So that means um, where they eat is where they poop. So it's kind of interesting. With sea anemones, if you touch a sea anemone, you can kind of feel it... Um, like holding on to you, like sticking to you, almost like Velcro. Um, with non-stinging, with non-venomous jellies, um, you'll be able to feel that as well, where it's it's like attached to you, like Velcro, but it's not stinging you. That's because you're touching it with your fingers, um, you with very um calloused areas of your body. We have some really thick skin on our hands, um, but underneath our arms and, and things like that is going to be more weak spots. But if you touch a, if you touch a, a sea anemone, a sea anemone uh, you won't be able to feel that venom, but if you lick it, uh, your tongue will actually become numb. Now, I'm not telling you to go lick an anemone, but if you ever get the opportunity and you know you're not allergic, then you can actually lick an anemone and you'll, your tongue will go numb because it actually is getting that venom into your tongue. So there's a lot of different ways to understand, um, but those nidocyte cells aren't actually getting through your skin um, when you're touching it with your hands. So um, because they're so calloused and thick and they're not really made to, to grab a whole person, they're made to grab small fish and plankton and things like that. 
Phylum mollusca is quite possibly the weirdest. A phylum mollusca, the requirement is to have a soft body. Um, there's a lot of different types of in phylum mollusca and a lot of really weird guys as well. So we have our octopus, squid, um, nudibranchs. This is uh, this little thing right here is, is a type of nudibranch and it is called a sea dragon and they get them in Corpus Christi a lot. Um, occasionally, I wouldn't say a lot, but occasionally. Um, so those are really cool. That's on my bucket list to be able to see one of those guys. We also have the cuttlefish. Um, uh, conch snails, um, giant clams, uh, regular clams that you see, marine clams. Um, you can have um, nudibranchs, you can have slugs. Um, these animals can be terrestrial or marine, um, but they all have a very soft body. They also have this thing called a mantle. So um, when we look at the oyster, it's a covering of basically their body parts. When we have a snail, um, it's basically their, their like whole bot, everything covering their body parts. With our cuttlefish, this is the mantle. Squid, this is the mantle. This part, this kind of almost like head part for the octopus as well, is the mantle. They also have a muscular foot. So with our octopus, our squid, and our cuttlefish, these are kind of like their little, their tentacles, their little tentacles or feetsies. Um, that is their muscular foot. But with our clams, that's their, their basically almost looks like a tongue. Their muscular foot can be a digging tool to dig into the sand. With oysters and a lot of our sessile clams, um, that will become the, um, the attachment part to the rock so they're going to stay there their entire life. With snails it becomes this radula, this, this zipper-like tongue that they'll use to scrape algae off the bottom. And they all will have this ability to produce a shell. So um, either that's a shell on the outside like our conch shell or giant clam or our marine clams or oysters, our mussels, our, um, our scallops, things like that. They um, they will have that outside external shell made of calcium carbonate. With our cuttlefish, um, uh, squid, octopus, they will have an internal um, structure as well. If you ever cut open a squid, you should see a kind of almost plastic-like piece um, that almost looks like a Capri Sun wrapper. Uh, it's very clear, it's very long, it's very thin, and that is their residual shell, the remaining shell made of, out of calcium carbonate. Cuttlefish will have a cuddle bone made out of calcium carbonate, which um, basically is the internal structure of their body as well. So they do have that ability to produce their shell, even if you don't visibly see it. And they also have a visceral mass. Um, some are a little bit more uh, intelligent than others, but visceral mass basically means this kind of brain sensory structure. So as we know, octopus are very smart creatures. Um, they're brilliant and they can use, um, they, they're so smart they can open jars. And then we have our, our clams and our snails who aren't quite as, as refined in their intelligence, but they um, do have a visceral mass, which is a brain structure to them. With squid, octopus, and cuttlefish too, they also have um, melanin in their skin, which is the same type of um, pigment that we have in our skin. So my favorite thing about squid and octopus and cuttlefish is they can change their color to camouflage. So they have basically all the same manipulation of the colors as, as people do. So like we can be really red in the face or um, can be tan or, or lighter in different parts of our skin things like that we can get we can get darker we can get lighter they can manipulate those colors and those pigments because of their cells um, so they can manipulate the different colors by basically manipulating the different cells or sacs of, of color that they have in their body so I love um, the phylum mollusca I think they're so weird and so awesome and they have a lot of really cool um, abilities to be able to um, be such a weird 
phylum, such a weird grouping. But once you break it down and you get closer and closer um, in the different classes and orders and, and um, genuses and species, then you can get a little bit more specific into just clams, just gastropods, which are snails, just octopus or, um, or uh, what we call cephalopods. So pretty cool. Now what I want you guys to do now that you know everything about invertebrates is to create your own invertebrate. So I want you to merge two different invertebrate phylums into one. You can choose an animal or you can choose characteristics of that phylum. Put them all together and try to make this really cool marine new marine species. So that's your challenge for this week and make sure you post it to the Flipgrid. Good luck scientist. I can't wait to see it.